eating a Reese's Nut Rageous candy bar, chocolate Why? candy, peanuts, peanut butter, and caramel, and lots of salt. Lots of salt. I think that's the, really the winning combination. It's the sugar balanced I, by the salt. Did I talk about this recently? My, one of my favorite Simpson clips is when Homer sits down with his jar of honey, honey roasted peanuts. No. And he reads the ingredients. The ingredients are salt. <laughs> <laughs> honey roast flavoring and pressed peanut sweepings. <laughs> <laughs> it's delectable. It's it is it is it's nice. stunning. So why are you eating a, a candy bar? What? Uh, what? Because I'm feeling I just feeling under the weather, and so the sugar kind of gives me a little energy bump so that I can have a conversation. So you don't like pass out in front of the mic. Yeah, okay. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the color doesn't drain entirely from my face, and then I kind of flop on the floor though that might make an excellent podcast event i don't know i think it'd be better if we had video but we don't have video we um, don't have video no we just got we just got our audio stuff. i don't know if we would have guests if we had video if we, we told them well you know you're going to be recorded everybody would primp and preen and get nervous. yeah you're right you're right there, there is a benefit to all audio there really yeah. is i mean just anyway. at least for guests but we're missing out on the whole youtube uh, you know, YouTube video thing. Uh, I might be able to find a way to get around that. There is a program that can sort of animate, create like animated. If I create some animated icons of our heads talking, like mouth open, mouth closed. I don't know. What, I might be able would, to do something. Why would we do that? What's the oh, point so we can put it on YouTube so that it would be a podcast on YouTube because YouTube wants to get into podcasting because they're canceling Google Podcasts in favor of YouTube. Like getting all your podcasts on YouTube. Okay, but I see lots of videos where it's just a slate. Yeah. I mean, Why is there to be? We could just put a slate up. We could certainly put a slate up or just the still image of the faces, you know, during the recording. Yeah. Right. So, okay. I mean, that's possible. That's it. Are we out of ideas? Yeah. <laughs> that's that, that's Thank the you, entirety. Everybody. <laughs> Good night. Good night, everybody. <laughs> we got nothing. Yep. No, I just came back from Sacramento. I think oh, I told really? you that, right? No. Yeah, I, I went to Sacramento for a family event. I'd never been to Sacramento before. It is exquisite. Really? Lovely, lovely place? I've lovely never place. Sacramento. Okay. Yeah. No, really, really, really gorgeous place. I really enjoyed it. Um, and it's just, you know, fiendishly expensive in some ways, Compa certainly compared to Syracuse. It's like Syracuse a lot, except that the weather's a lot nicer. Interesting. But it's okay. still the wide, very beautiful, beautiful trees. I mean, yeah, magnificent yeah. trees, including California redwoods. I mean, those really, those towering uh, evergreen trees, which are fabulous. Um, uh, wide streets lined with trees with architecture from the 1940s and the 1920s. Um, no, no billboards, none of that stuff. It just, it really struck me a lot like Syracuse, except it's, you know, it's 70 degrees instead of 50 degrees right now. Sequoia would be an excellent wordle word, except that it's six letters. I don't think you're really listening to me. I, I think you're, I don't I'm, think, I'm picking out words and then I don't I'm reacting. Think, I don't think that, that advanced the arc of my narrative in any way whatsoever. No, you know, the, what you're saying is getting through my ears, but you just then don't it care. It's my yeah. brain, and my brain is just not <laughs> functioning, and that causes the, the 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 categorical mismatch. So they have a 35 mile uh, long park along the American River, which I biked oh. part of, and it was Ooh. gorgeous, gorgeous, beautiful path. Actually, it's like three different paths along the river. There's like a high path, a middle path, and a low path. What? What brought you out to Sacramento? Why did you? A family event. Okay. Uh, yeah, I think I don't, I don't want to say anything yeah, more than yeah, that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but it was a family event um, that took place in a park in Sacramento. It was a marriage, um, mm. and it took place in a park in Sacramento. Um, and the newlyweds actually got, I shouldn't say it, but they got a photograph with Gavin Newsom. Oh. Um, yeah, it was great. It was a lot. Of, I wasn't there. I mean, 
people like me don't don't get that close to that stuff. But it was lovely. All joking aside, it was a lovely, lovely time. And I just like Sacramento a lot. I thought it was really great. If I had like a million bucks lying around, I'd be there in a heartbeat. Nice. Um, so that was nice. And now I'm back in Syracuse, which I love too. Syracuse is a great place too. Excellent. Yeah. Um, uh, do you have any new favorite cafes? Have you discovered anything new that in, in Syracuse that, that you want to mention? Well, no, just the usual places we go. I mean, there's, there's a place like there's recess coffee. There's a whole, there's a whole, so you remember in Philly, they had South street, right? You yeah. know, South street, which was like the hipper vibe. That's, that's Westcott in Syracuse. Oh, okay. There's okay. an area called Westcott. Uh, and, and the, the sort of the epicenter of Westcott is about seven blocks, 10 blocks from where I live. Perfect walk. It's a 15 minute walk there. Get my coffee, walk back. It's magnifico. Is there, is there still a place called happy endings? Was that, there was a club that I used to play called happy endings. I don't know. It might, might've been like a cafe bakery. I do I'm not looking, know. I'm looking it up. Endings. Syracuse. <laughs> do it. Uh, no, it closed. Eh. Oh, well, bummer. Oh, well. The, the, the place that my daughter and I have been to at least three times, not four times, is Kitty Hoyne's Irish Bar in downtown, which is really great. Huh. It really is. There's a lot of hustle and bustle, and they got some really, uh, I just I really, it's a, it's a good place. They, they got Guinness on tap, um, and they got good food. And the people are always nice to us when we get there. And it's always, it's always a little loud, but not horribly so. Right. Um, so anyway, uh, no new places, not really. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I was in Syracuse the past weekend and the weekend before that I was, where was I? I was somewhere else. I oh, was so at your place. Yeah. Yeah. I was, you're in, here Boston. In, Boston. I was in Boston. That was in Syracuse. So I haven't been, I, uh, Sacramento. So I haven't been doing a lot of exploring, but I did read a book. Oh, what did you read? I read two books. Oh, I think God. I told you. So I read one of the books that I think was it Sarah suggested or one of our esteemed prior guests. Yeah, Sarah Elkins. Right. I don't know if it's Sarah that suggested this one, but the author is a Polish uh, author who won the Nobel Prize. Yeah. Called Olga Tokarsuk. And I'm probably murdering the name. Yeah. And the name of the book is Drive Your Plow Over the Bones of the Dead. Okay. And it's, I really enjoyed it. It's wow. because it has that thing, you know, we've talked about many times before. It has that one thing that I now realize every book I really like has to have, which is it has a great sense of humor. Oh, wow. Okay. Um, and it's very, very funny. It's very much sort of that Eastern European sense of humor. Wow. Um, did you ever read any of the Martin Martin Cruz Smith books like Gorky Park and no, Polar Star? And, yeah. They're fabulous hmm. um, because – he, Martin Cruz Smith, has this character. Well, he has the main character, which is Arkady Renko. Arkady Renko. Yeah. And there's just a very, that. and he's just, a, and he's just, he's a very specific person with just this incredibly defeatist sense of wit. Um, and what he does is that when he, his, his primary thing that he does is that when he's caught in a tight situation, he complicates it. Mm-hmm. And that's how he confounds everybody is that when he's stuck in a tight circle, he just makes it worse for himself and it really throws people off. And there's something very sort of fatalist Eastern European about the entire thing. And she has that vibe. Okay. Um, and it's a really, it's a really, it, it's an, it's a murder mystery. Yeah. Um, and it takes place in a, a small community in Poland. Um, and it, a lot of it is about, uh, it's incredible. It's, it centers on one character and you're inside that one character's head a lot. Huh. Um, and it's a very unusual place to live. Um, and it's a lot about animal rights mm-hmm. and how we treat animals. Um, and it's about corruption. Um, and it's about being ignored. Um, and it's very, very funny, um, and very true. And I think it's definitely worth Anybody, I, I think it's definitely worth uh, people's time. If they right, want to read I'll, that one. I'll, I'll, I'll read it because well, no, um, you don't have to. I mean, I'm just oh, saying, wait. can you do me a favor? Yeah. Um, your, your plosives, your plosives are, are plosive, are plosive. Yes. Okay. How's uh, that? Any better? That is, uh, that is, yeah. Maybe split the difference on that. How okay, about that? that how, is that yeah. better? Okay. That's good. But okay. Can you turn the volume up now a little bit? What? What is this? 
It's like a, it's our sound check after the fact that you kind of twisted the knob since we did like fine. Our, oh god. This is impossible. I can't work under these conditions. I just I just I just you know, it's the I can't fix the plosives. How about that? Is that, that better? That's good. Just don't pee like don't like, What? Don't explode. pee? Don't what? Explode You're the one who just your... hit the head. Fine. Fine. How's that? Yeah, is oh, that yeah, bad? That's, that's just great. That's, no, seriously. Everybody isn't... loves that. Oh yeah, well yeah, if you do it right into the right into the diaphragm. But I'm, not, I'm trying to do, I'm trying to do it past. No, that was good. We, it was good when you did it past when you said past. okay, that's probably good. That's good. Yeah, that's good. That's is much that better. better. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think we should have like 20 minutes of this. Yeah, just adjusting the mic and we it's can just change like, the name of the podcast to adjusting the mic. You know what? We'd we'd have we'd have a dedicated fan base. <laughs> just the more ridiculous, the more inconsequential, the more <laughs> inexplicable the things that we do in this podcast, the greater. Yeah. How about now? Is this better? <laughs> <laughs> wait, I've got an idea. Hold on. Wait, I'm going to. What are you going to play? I think, I think I've. Okay. I think I've got it now. <laughs> what, what, how does that sound? <laughs> so Olga has written many books. Okay. And I started reading another one called The Books of Jacob. And that one didn't thrill me as much because first off the bat, it's 900 pages. Mm. And second off the bat, it's sort of kind of the same vibe. It's about these obsessive characters, like these people who are really obsessive and their, their obsessions yeah. Um, and that can get a little claustrophobic after a while, um, in, in drive your plow. And there's a lot of wit, there's a lot of love, but there's a lot of really sad stuff in it. It's really, um, it's, it's clever. It's a, it's, it's an interesting book. It's interesting to see. And the, the trick is, is that it's in a translation. So who knows how it really sounds? Yeah. I don't really trust translations. Um, so but, who knows? But Sarah, Sarah attested to the idea that that uh, um, there, there was a Polish reader that she knew that was reading it, and and that she was reading it in English, oh. and 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 found it to be. I don't know if she was doing comparative between the Polish and the English, but well, the funny thing is that there's a whole section. Oh, I'm sorry. There's another big thing that flows uh, the artistic, the artistic keel of the entire book is the poetry of William Blake. Oh, okay. Are you familiar with him? A little bit, yeah. Yeah, the songs of innocence and experience yeah. and stuff like that. And there's a, there's a wonderfully and then this is and of course Jorge is always sort of lurking around whenever always. we go, always lurking around because part one of the things in the book is trans, uh, the 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 narrator and one of her friends sitting at the coffee table translating William Blake from English into Polish. mm Hmm. And then saying, is that the right words? Because you could rephrase William Blake's thing as three different ways. Like, and so they took a, a William Blake's uh. thing and then it gets rephrased three times. But of course we're reading an English translation of Olga's book. Of, of so the, the translation th into Polish. Uh, yeah. Yeah. It trans yeah. Right. right. And so what you read is you read one thing in English and then three other things in English. But what they're supposed to be is and then you just get hopelessly. And but, then, of course, what that triggers to me is an article I read about um, when Madonna, this is an article from like 30 years ago when Madonna came out with this book called Sex. Yeah. And um, what happened was there is something, something, it, it was an article called Lost in Translation where Madonna um, was being interviewed by some, uh, like somebody, Hungarian. Um, mm -hmm. And the interview is being trans, but the, the interviewer had read an article of Madonna's that had been written in English then trans or written in French and then translated Hungarian. And the first question um, out of the uh, the interviewer's mouth was, "Why did you call your new book Slut?" And Madonna, <laughs> Madonna said, "No, it's not called Slut. It's called Sex." And they said, "Well, not here. It's called Slut." <laughs> and the interview just goes downhill that's, from that's there. That's wild. <laughs> so oh, that, that's so funny. Well, the, yeah, the danger of having your book uh, translated. Interestingly, there is someone in Japan who's translating my first novel, uh, just on a voluntary basis. Mm -hmm. And um, hopefully I'll hear back from her. Uh, and that, that, that would be interesting. But I, I would have no way, except if I go through my friend Mamie, you know, to, to like check it. So I said I would, I would approve it, you know, but I would have to ask my friend Mamie to 
read through it and make sure that it that it somehow yeah. matched up with with what I was doing. Yeah, um, I mean that that that's a that's a rabbit hole that's a million miles deep, which yeah. is lot. And so, and that also sort of triggers thoughts of Douglas Hofstetter, um, who wrote Gerda Lesher Bach and wrote right. Magical Themas and the set of all sets that do not con contain themselves. Yeah, it's Bertrand Russell's paradox, yeah. and what and what and what uh, Hofstadter talked about was how do you translate Jabberwocky into French? Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's really interesting. Well, you have to do it very artistically. You really have yes. to kind of reinvent it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's no other way. Yeah, it's, it's that sort of it's that sort of you know Edward Lear and that that whole movement of playing with language and uh, playing with the English language, and then how do you kind of make that work in other languages. So there's no universal code for the brain, you know, can't um, do a one-to-one -one comparison. No. And so speaking of playing with words, so after I read Olga's book, I read 13 Clocks that oh, you turned me on to. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. What a book. What a book. Yeah. What an interesting book. What a, sort of an indescribable book. Yes. I mean, it's lovely. It's lovely, but you can't put your finger on it. It's really interesting. It just occupies this weird sort of netherworld. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I hardly recommend it to everybody. Yeah, Neil Gaiman calls it the best book ever written. Um, and it's interesting. You know, there is this uh, political commentator, Keith Oberman, who used to, is also a sports commentator, who does a podcast now, and he includes some sports stuff, and some he gripes about working in um, in media and then on every every Friday he reads Thurber he reads a story from James Thurber yeah but he has not touched the 13 clocks he's read I think all of his short stories but will not like take a chapter out of the 13 clocks to read I think some of that is it's just some of the best writing uh, ever it's so much fun and the structure of it the poetry of it the repetition the characters it's lovely yeah yeah no, it was it was a lot of fun. I had a I had a great time uh, reading that one. So, what do you got? I would what love you... to turn it into a musical. Actually, I think you know it, it, it would be fabulous musical. It'd be yeah. I'm a, I'm absolutely amazed that it hasn't been turned into a musical. I've heard that it was done once at a high school, but it doesn't exist anywhere. That doesn't exist anywhere. So I maybe take another crack at it. Um, I have a, I have a couple of songs written for it, but. Um, oh, that'd be yeah. great. Yeah, it would be. I mean, I don't really know how to write a musical, but that hasn't stopped me. Let's have a show. I know. <laughs> I, I am so not a musical guy. Although I love, you know, I love Chicago and Sweeney Todd and, you know, the darker musicals I love. Um, but, but uh, not, um, I, yeah, I, I think, I think it would be fun. I think it would be a blast. The goal do you know any, the do, you, do you know any of those? Because they're like, a, they're, that's a particular tribe. Oh, I know. I know. Do you, do you know any of those people? Do I know musical people? Yeah, I know some. Yeah, sure. Actually, we should, you should talk to Bob because Bob knows Bob some might, of, yeah. Bob knows some of those hardcore, like Broadway people. Like he, I think he knows one, she's this singer and she's just right there. It's like, Okay, and a one, and a two, yeah. you know, rah, da, da, let's go well, ray for Hollywood, you know, that whole thing. That's what you need. You need those people who are totally jazzed about musicals. I would also have to get permission from from uh, the Thurber's family, right? Whoever mm -hmm. is in charge of his his memory. Um, and unfortunately, it probably means writing the whole musical and then finding out that they don't want me to do it. But um, that, you know, it's a risk worth taking probably or if you just write one tune you write one song and send it to them and say hey look am i am i, am I walking off the cliff here yeah exactly is this, is this, is this, is this i wouldn't write the entire thing and then then ask yeah, them if it's okay I I, I, I'd, I'd maybe test the waters and say yeah here we go and they'll probably say you know well anyway who a knows what of, they would say a lot of things would be lost there's just so much that happens in in the book it's not a long book it's quite short but it but there's so much that happens that you you some of which you just couldn't you know the the uh, a clock in the town a, a bell from the clock in the town dropped its lonesome tone I, I, the uh, the spy disappeared into the night like a fly into the mouth of a frog you know, right there are just wonderful uh, sentences in there that are that are impossible so would you need to have it. a narrator yeah 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 possibly yeah. Uh, it could also, the narrator could be the Golux. It's hard to say. Um, 
yeah, it seems to me like it would be ripe. Yeah. Um, but who knows? Who knows? So that's good. I read that. Yeah. Good book. I have been, uh, I have not been reading so much. I have really gotten into this YouTube artist, um, thinker and philosopher and historian, Andrewism. Uh, and, you know, anything you find on YouTube is highly suspect. But a friend of mine pointed out, it was Michael Miner who had read my books, and he said, you should really check out Andrewism's video on the barter economy, the myth of the barter economy. And I did, and I was immediately hooked. It's this wonderful, he has a Trinidadian accent, and he just tears apart, you know, traditional understandings of uh, economics, of family, the history of family, the history of, of money, the history of um, uh, uh, community, of civilization. And he's a solar punk activist. So he believes in, you know, libraries of everything or a library society, library economy is a path into the future that is uh, sustainable. And it's, it's very interesting. So I, I, I became a supporter of his on Patreon and I've, um, I've been checking out his, his videos, which are all really quite good. Um, Andrewism, Andrewism. St. Andrew, I believe on social media in a lot of places. Uh, I don't know. On Patreon, it's not St. Andrew, is it? I can find out in a second. I think it's, you can find him under Andrewism. Yeah. So, uh, St. Saint, Saint Drew, that's it. St. Drew. Uh, and he's working on a book. And I, he's quite popular, but, I, you know, it'd be lovely to have him on the pod if he would be willing. Sure. Yeah. Interesting thinker, interesting guy, like a, a Mardo for our times. He's sort of uh, helping us to uh, piece together history in a sane way. Uh, so would give give me some highlights like what what yeah, I think, so yeah i mean a lot of what was great about the the video on the barter economy you know, these videos are just you know pictures and mostly him just talking in essay form clearly he's written it all out beforehand um and it in the barter the myth of the barter economy the the upshot is that what we think of as the barter economy preceding the dawn of money uh, to fix the ways in which it didn't work is just an invention of um, uh, Smith, of um, uh, birth of, uh, is it birth, is it birth of nations, Adam, uh, Smith. Adam Smith, and of Aristotle, and more or less people who are trying to justify capitalism. Um, or whatever, earlier forms of relying on exchange and markets. And what he, what he comes to is, if you actually look at the archaeological history, barter didn't exist except uh, when people were sailing to a place and they had goods and they were coming to a place that didn't, you know, didn't share the same currency. It's a post-currency event in most cases where people don't have the same currency, say like uh, explorers arrive at Tahiti and they have some things that the people, they think the people in Tahiti will want and then they trade them for other goods that the people in Tahiti have. Well, that's one example of barter, but that's not, that's not a, that doesn't work over. It's not a system. system. Yeah, it's, it's not, not a system. system. And in some cases, uh, people who are doing trade, you know, traders who are traveling, would exchange and barter, but only when they were certain that they were traveling to a place where there was another merchant who would have exactly what they needed. Mm -hmm. So that's sort of predetermined. So that's also not a global system. And in a local system, that's not how things worked at all, right? You don't, you don't sort of do this, uh, I'll give you two cows and you give me a goat and some pineapples and I'll take that and I'll get some pumpkins. That's, you know, that's actually not how people who know each other would operate. They would operate on a system of kind of loose credit with each other. And so what he comes down to is that what, it, what probably existed amongst people in tribes and throughout a lot of the agricultural development of, of uh, humanity was uh, the gifting economy. And there is evidence for that. There's evidence, of, there's archaeological evidence, and there's evidence of it in modern history as well. And the gifting economy is 
so close to what I'm writing in my books, except that it's a non-technological gifting economy. You sort of, you sort of keep get a sense of who's more generous with their gifts, who's able to be more generous, who's you know who is less generous, and then there's a kind of flow toward the the generosity, and that's fascinating. So it's I mean I'm not doing it justice. I think you'd have to watch the whole thing to to get. Uh, where he's coming from. But the myth of the barter, you know, bartering as being kind of this broken system that was fixed by the introduction of coins is, according to him, a myth. Hmm. So, fascinating. And then cool. uh, there's other pieces on, he, he does a lot on solar punk and he does a lot on um, the dawn What's of solar agriculture. Punk? Solar punk is, I mean, the books that I'm writing are solar punk novels. So they are um, uh, different from steampunk and okay. different from cyberpunk. So solar punk is uh, more of a hopeful um, visioning of the future. I mean, it can have downsides. There are a number of solar what, uh, novels that would be called solar punk that also, you know, that aren't entirely utopian. But they do involve ex sort of a coexistence in nature and uh, sustainable forms of living. Oh. And are there some classics of the genre? I don't know that it's been around long enough to have classics. It, it was sort of postulated in the 1970s, I believe. I don't know the history of solar punk. No, it might have been later than that. It might have been, it might have been in the 1990s. But, but it, um, because I think it started with a blog post. Right, there weren't blog posts in 1970, so uh, I believe it was sort of we need to create a kind of thinking that is solar punk, that is not cyberpunk and is not steampunk. So it would have been an offshoot of both of those, right? Um, and it is more than just writing; it really is uh, more of a general oh, philosophy, way of life. You know that I think it in. People want to embody this, this idea, this ideology of uh, libraries of everything, you know, where you no, you, you don't go and buy an electric drill. You go and take it out from the library. Sure. And then you don't store an electric drill. And we've talked about this. Yeah. You know, the, the advantages of having a common repository for shared items yeah. where you're held accountable if you wreck it. Right. I mm -hmm. mean, you wreck the book, you have to pay for it. Um, you know, the library has certain mechanisms in place that encourage uh, not exactly ethical behavior, but considerate behavior, right? Neighborliness. Uh, you don't return the book late and you don't mess up the book and you return it in the same condition as you borrowed it, etc. And that would also extend to cars, you know, <laughs> yeah, or whatever, you know, electric bikes, whatever it is that the library of things would have. And I look forward to having Lee Hurwitz on. And I don't know if she's done much thought about uh, library of Things, but she's a librarian at Brooklyn Public Library that has um, been working on its booked un Books Unbanned project uh, that has gotten a lot of press. And actually, Leah has been in high demand, but I do know her personally, so she's willing to come and talk to us. So I think that's happening in November. Cool. Yeah. Yeah, the, the whole, uh, we talked about, I think, me personally, I think one of the great things Possibly about the library of things is drones. You yeah. so so I can drop stuff off for you because that's the problem with the library of things is like I mean why do we buy this crap? Well because so it's right there when we need it. Yeah, and there's there's certain things that you need all that like a broom. You're gonna you, you're gonna have a broom. No, you're gonna you're gonna have your own broom. And you're gonna have it in the house. And there's things where you're definitely you're not gonna buy a a, a carpet cleaner. Uh, right. But between those two things, there's a wide range of objects and things which you only need occasionally to do stuff. Yeah. A lot of it in the hardware, you know, sort of like the tool world. Um, but maybe you're throwing a fancy party and you need a blah, blah, blah. Yeah, but I have a problem. There, there is a basic problem with drones. I mean, there are many problems with drones. Right? I, I think Amazon tried to do the drone delivery and, and it totally went nowhere. One of the big problems is noise. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, the noise of the drone, the intrusiveness of it, these things kind of flying around, some some drone at eye level just coming into land, you know, like whacking some kid in the face. And there's 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 issues with that. But maybe it's possible 
and, and now we're moving much more sort of in the direction of the merit economy, but maybe it's possible to incentivize people to deliver things from the library the, of everything um, on foot. I would, I would say, you know, get up and take a walk, right? It, uh, it's the library. Uh, it's the library. I know. You'll meet I people. Know. Well, yeah, yeah, unless the person's like across town. But I think yeah. you got to try it out. I mean, you got to get it going. I think it, I, th I think yeah, I think drones big. would help a lot. I think and yeah, if they're if it's if it, if the sky is black with drones and they're yeah, flying I mean, like flies, yeah, maybe we need to rethink this whole thing. You think but, about the average number of Amazon deliveries that take place in a given day at any given address. Uh, yeah, I think I think the drone thing would get pretty bad pretty fast. Well, one way to find out. We yeah, can do, we'll just, we can do we'll a just, test. We'll just do it. <laughs> do a test and see how many bodies hit the ground. But one of the key things that people are used to now is immediacy. Yeah. I, I need a 316 inch bit. I know. Now, what's interesting is that people will get in a car and they will drive to Home Depot. Right. I'm not, I'm not to speaking. buy that damn thing. Right. Yeah, and they'll drive, drive pretty the far. I mean, you know. I mean, right. And drive. you could, if you really wanted so you could get in there. But the thing is, is that. Home Depot is a fun place to go. I mean, I, I go there for entertainment, quite frank, frankly. Um, well, then then that's how the library needs to be. The, the library has know. to be entertaining. Yeah, it has yeah. to be, it, it has to have a coffee bar in it or something yeah, like usually, that. They actually do a lot of them. And Boston Public Library is really pretty, pretty fantastic that way. And there are branches. So there's not a single library. There are multiple libraries. Right. And if this were popular, there'd be a lot of multiple libraries. So but it's a very, it's a fairly narrow sliver of objects though. That's the thing is that it's, it's definitely within a certain range of objects of things that you need occasionally, but you don't need all the time or the, yeah. Like yeah I that said, you don't need immediately too. Right. So you do have things like rent a center and you do have, you know, the, mm. the local, the local supermarket does rent out carpet cleaner, carpet washers which is one of those objects that falls into a very specific niche where it's worthwhile for them to rent them to you. Uh, you're not going to buy one yourself, but you're willing to rent it. I think pressure washers would fall into that. Uh, car fixing tools, like if you need yeah. ramps and stuff like that. Um, your, your crepe pan is not going to work, or, or a vacuum cleaner, because you're going to need that, you know, there's going to be a mess, and you're going to need a vacuum cleaner to clean it up right away. You're not well, going to be to pick it up. Yeah. Vacuum right. cleaners are are the kind of thing where you probably want to have that thing on a semi permanent basis. Yeah, you're um, going to use it, you know, more than once more than a once month. a week, right? Yeah, and, and depending um, on how you vacuum. Right, more than once a year. How much um, of a slob you are, <laughs> but yeah, but you have a you have that. But I mean, what are the things that I've bought recently that probably I could have shared? Uh, I don't. I know that's something I attached to a wall. I that's a personal item. Um, definitely, you know, books. I mean, that's why I love Libby so much. Right. I think Libby's fabulous, but the problem is it's like, it's not generating any money for anybody. So the authors are not getting anything back. Um, yeah, the libraries buy the copies of books and they buy them at a, at a higher rate. I mean, they buy, they buy them at a higher price actually to, to kind of account for balance that. it out. Yeah. yeah. So, but I love, I'm, I'm becoming more of a fan of, of physical books. So it'd be nice, you know, if I could go down to the library, but again, it's about immediacy. A lot of things are about immediacy. Well, where like, is your nearest library? Do you know? Oh yeah. It's, it's about seven blocks away, <laughs> 10 blocks away. But it's, but you want the drone. <laughs> <laughs> what? Well, I'm sorry, no. I'm laughing. Well, no, it's a small branch library. They're yeah, not okay. going to have what I want. I they're am. not going to. Statistically speaking, they're not going to have what I want. Right. Um, in fact, the whole system may not have what I want. I mean, do they have 13 clocks at the Westcott branch, the Pettit branch, Very, in Syracuse? Yeah, it's hard to say. Mm, yeah. Yeah. Highly yeah. unlikely. And, but, and you know, niche authors um, like Robert Whitehill that that you know unlikely, yeah. for, unlikely. But you can get digital, but you want a physical book. So, and then there are other problems like everyone needs a snow shovel at a certain time. And if you rely on a library, there's you know how many snow shovels can they have? They would need one for everybody, and then well, they need to store yeah. them. You know, so but the key thing about snow shovels is that's cheap. I mean, a snow shovel yeah. is a fairly inexpensive device. Like. A carpet cleaner to come back to that horrible oh, thing yeah, they keep harping on. Yeah, that's a that's a you know now as soon as you break like the hundred dollar barrier, you're getting to things where people are going to start getting pissed off that they have to buy one and they right. only use it like four times in their entire life. Yeah. So 
you, that's the low hanging fruit, but who knows, who knows, who knows, who knows, who knows. But I thought I, I do like, um, drones have the potential to do a lot of things. Now, if they make them quieter and yeah, they put parachutes on them, which they've done. In fact, they put parachutes on the, on the new taxi that's coming out, mm. uh, the drone taxi, um, cars. I mean, of course the great thing would be is if you could hail them and they could drive themselves. I mean, yes. that's the key thing. Is well, that yeah, you say- and it, they are doing that in San Francisco. That's, that's happening. Um, and there's actually a movement there's in protest of that. There's, um, uh, there's sort of a bicyclist movement out there where they're putting orange cones on top of, or in front of cars, mm-hmm. uh, self-driving cars, so that they're stuck and they can't yeah. get out of the space. Um, uh, yeah, there, there, there is a protest. I mean, and their, their point is we don't need more cars. This is just generating more cars. In theory, it shouldn't. In theory, it should lower the number of cars. Right. But I'm not sure that in practice it actually does. Oh, one way to find out. Yeah, um, right. <laughs> but uh, yeah, I mean, just just do it. But it'd be really cool. I mean, if you do have a situation where I can reliably, I can take my smartphone and say, I need a car in the next five minutes. And it drives itself to my to my door and I can get in it and go food shopping and then drive it home and leave it there and it goes off. And the economics, that'd be really cool, I well, think. I mean, we do have a lot of this right now. In, in, you know, it's all human generated. Um, yeah. There, there, is a, there is a mode of thought that says the future is actually much more human labor than robotic labor um, because it's cheap. Um, but, you know, which is sad. But there, there's all the food delivery services that exist now that sort of thrived during the pandemic. There's Uber, there's Lyft. There's Zipcar, which hasn't really done as well as I kind of thought it would. Um, you know, so there's sort of this sharing kind of morphing of taxis. That's all, you know, it's, it's also got its own set of problems. Uh, I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that the library of everything, the library of things works. And, and if we talk to a real librarian, they may have some ideas about how that, about how that would shake out or how that is shaking out. In, yeah. in in reality, because everything works in my imagination. Yeah, <laughs> everything works great on on the whiteboard. So what else? So you 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 hit Saint Andrew or Saint Drew or whatever. What uh, else? You- Andrewism. 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 Yeah, uh, yeah. That's I mean that's the, been the most interesting thing I've come across recently. Um, Andrewism. Uh, not not a lot else. I'm trying to get through Piranesi with with uh, with the daughters, but. Uh, Zoe is has a ton of homework every night, and so she doesn't get to sleep until after uh, after uh, my youngest gets to sleep. Um, so reading that, time has been truncated. Yeah. yeah. Oh well. Yeah. So well, what's in store for the weekend? Catherine is racing in the head of the Charles oh, tomorrow. Yeah. Oh, great! In a single, and she has been racing in the head of the Charles in a single for twenty-four consecutive years. Yeah, and it's not easy to get in, so it's it's really quite an accomplishment. And um, I'll be taking the girls over to uh, a boathouse up the Charles River near the finish line to watch to watch her row by, and we're going to scream and yell. That's great. Yeah. We Didn't do we do that year. once? Didn't you come to Philly one time? Yeah, you guys came down to yeah, Philly. Yeah, we came down for, for Catherine did a race down there on the, on right. the Schuylkill. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was great. Yeah. I mean, you know, and she's been racing all over the place. She's gone to Lucerne. She's, uh, uh, she's raced elsewhere in Europe. I can't remember where, but I do remember Lucerne. And um, she went to Australia to train. Wow. Yeah, she's serious about it. Wow. It's a big deal for her. So um, that will be fun. I don't know what the heck we're doing after that. I'm going to try and sleep a lot because I'm just feeling like crap and I need to feel better. Yeah. Well, on that uplifting note, how about we call it a a day? That's a good idea. Okay. Uh, All right, Lionel. Until next time. Until next time. God willing. Funny Not Funny is produced by Jim Infantino at Slab Media in Boston. Lionel Casson is the co-host. Our website is funnynotfunny.bigego.com. The background music you're listening to is the song Hum from Utopia Revisited by Jim Infantino. 
The opinions presented by the co-hosts are ridiculous and should not be taken seriously by anyone. Our intended audience is literally nobody. If you're listening to this podcast, you should stop immediately and seek help. Please do not subscribe or leave a rating or review. It only encourages us to make more. Thanks for listening. So after we stopped recording, we kept talking and then we realized we should be recording again. So we did. So what I was, what I was talking to you about is people, people write all these books about like the Babylonians, how they lived. It's like, you, we have no idea how they lived. Right, I mean, right. you, you've got like a couple of pot shards, you know, and some inscriptions somewhere and like the, the Epic of Gilgamesh or whatever. And, it's not like we have like reams and re- megabytes of data about birth, death, and fertility and stuff like that. Um, and one of the things I find fascinating is the 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 charred scrolls that they found in Vesuvius. Mm-hmm. Did you hear about this one? Yeah, but did we talk about did we? <coughs> no, we talked about we talked about the ashes of Vesuvius, the depth of the ashes and the animals. The, the skeletons, right. No, sorry. Totally different topic. They found a library. In fact, they found it a long time oh. ago. And they found a library. So everything was in scrolls, these tightly wound scrolls. They're, yeah, the they're charred, they, yeah. They've been charred. And there's no way you can unwrap them. They look like right. briquettes. I right. mean, they're literally like briquettes. And you can't, you, you, you basically can't touch. I mean, you can't, you, you don't even begin to think about unrolling them. Right. And finally... Um, a bunch of teams around the world have put together like scanning electron, blah, 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 with computer yeah. program. And they're starting to read them yeah, without unwrapping them. And they think it's a, they think it's a very, very large library of uh, Epicurean philosophy. Oh, um, because they think that it was, that it was actually a library that belonged to pr- how possibly an Epicurean philosopher, thinker, writer, intellectual. Um, I'm probably mangling this horribly, but the cool news is that they have a lot of freaking scrolls and they can start reading them. Right. And so this is going to be an amazing window back into what was it? 70 AD. Yeah. Because as I mentioned, there's not a lot. We have stories, you know, we have we have a book here and a book there, but that's been copied a million times. But to actually get our hands on an actual book from 70 AD, like, and I think there's like a hundred of them or hundreds of these scrolls. Yeah. Now, they may all be like really crappy books, but still, it's going to be pretty amazing to it's see. Just what's, pornography. I mean, like. It's just. It's the Reader's Digest and stuff like that, or who knows? It's like or Harlequin romances from, yes, from the yes, Roman Empire. That's right. Hastily, yes. he tore she tore off his toga. Um, <laughs> <you know. laughs> meet, meet cute at the Herculaneum. Um, so, but it'd be really fascinating to see it. So, so that's why I'm I'm saying, and I think I think uh, the guy Andrew sort of touches on this is that it's really hard to make any kind of statement about what was happening on happening yes. like fifteen thousand years ago. I mean, we got some arrowheads. Yeah, I mean, we there got, is evidence of of older civilizations than we had thought, but it's hard to say, right? It's hard. To, what what kind of civilization was it? Was it hierarchical? Was it non hierarchical? You know, really tough. Hard to say. Hard to say. I mean, Andrew um, makes a he makes a a hard argument for, you know, previous civilizations being non-hierarchical, but he leaves it open. Yeah. Um, and, and he, there, then he does cite some evidence for it, but, but yes, I mean, anthropological, archeological evidence, it, it is, it is flawed. And as, as I mentioned to you before, you know, they recently are using, so I'm always fascinated by the technological side. They're using ground, pen, uh, uh, researchers are using ground penetrating radar. They're using ground penetrating radar to scan the jungles of Central America for remains of uh, uh, pre-Columbian cities and, right. and structures. And they're finding them all over the place. They're finding right. far more than they ever expected to find. They're all just buried. So it's completely revamping everybody's idea about how sophist- how widespread, like right. how much population these civilizations were bearing. Well, this is one of the points in, in, in Andrew's uh, video about agriculture was just that 
we think there was a dawn of agriculture because we think of agriculture in one specific way. There was agriculture. It just didn't look like the you know what we're used to in Europe. Right. The um, package. The yeah. the the the, uh, the Eurasian package. Yeah. Is, and if and it was one elite. of the one of the granddaddies of this is Guns, Germs, and Steel by uh, yes. by Jared Diamond, um, which has been very controversial, but a, a fascinating. I really. I like I just like the the bizarreness of his thought. But there's a package and it was plows and it was wheat and it was the it was the four dom- four core domesticated animals like the horse, the chicken, the pig, um, the sheep, I think. Those are the food animals, it's like that. But in 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 the new world you had what, the three sisters? Which yes. is corn, yes. and that was and, agriculture. Yeah, right. And that was a whole other way of doing it, of of getting a lot of agriculture, corn. getting a lot of output out of a given acre. Corn, was, beans, squash. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and you, uh, and you uh, farm together. Them. And what I want to know more about is the Lenape people. The Lenape people pr- practiced a radical form of agriculture that involved periodic burnings and. Um, that it was remarkably successful uh, so that when people arrived in New York for the first time, they saw these like this wonderland and they thought this was just nature. There was like, you know, butterflies mm-hmm. everywhere, great, great teeming masses of uh, birds and fish just kind of falling out of the river, uh, ready to be eaten. And this was really because of the way the Lenape people had had treated the land for 6000 years. And um, they just came along and thought, oh, good, something, something virgin. There's nobody here. Uh, right. Excuse me. We've been here. Yeah, we're over here. We've been but here yeah. a lot longer than you're going to be here, you know, so. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But, yeah, so I, I, that, that's my argument for Andrew. But I would say it'd be great for, to, for us to take two sides of it, you know, pick a, pick a video and, and tear it apart, like you said. Well, I don't want to tear it apart, but I just, I just, it's much more interesting. Well, yeah, it's it's a little unfair. I, again, I, as I mentioned, part of my problem with it, not my problem with it, but uh, it's just, I, I'm, I, I'm sort of developing an allergic reaction to YouTube in general. Okay, with people saying. Oh, you're so you don't understand what's going on. Yeah. This is the massive conspiracy. It's like, yeah. dude, yeah, yeah. Dude. No, no. I, I, I mean, I, 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 I preface that. I just think that this that he that he's actually done the work. Yeah, that it's there's something that it's, there that it's intellectually valid, and and um, he is using a popular medium to get it across. And I don't, I don't think it's going to turn any big light bulbs on for us, but I think for a lot of people it will. Yeah, I mean, I, I, yeah, for me, the the the. The key moment for me was, uh, we've discussed this before, when I listened to this Planet Money podcast about modern monetary theory, yes. MMR. Yeah. And I don't, I don't necessarily agree with it or disagree with it, but what I loved is how they turned everything upside down. Right. And said, nah, we don't tax to spend. We, ta- we actually just decide what we're going to spend, and then we print it. And we use taxation to bleed excess cash out of the economy so we don't run into inflation. That's what's really happening. I was so- like... Whoa! <laughs> yeah, and the more I mean, and this is where you know my contention is money is a global religion, and, and and that and that it is it is the one global religion that that we all share because we believe in the value of of currency. But but the the um, recently in writing writing my book, I've come to a chapter where I was really able to express Mardo's point of view on uh, the the deep issue with money, and he says to another character, he says. Because money is getting re- reintroduced, and and um, he says it's a it's a categorical mismatch. I mean, if I tell you how much you like this vase or the, how much you like this tree, you'll say, you know, I like it. I like it a lot. It's beautiful. It 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 sh- it's got shade. It, it it's physically pleasing. It's in good health. All that. I you know the qualities are subjective qualities. If I tell you how many, if I ask you how many you like this tree, you'll say, I don't know what you're talking about. Right. But that's what money is asking us to do. Put a number on how much you like it, and it's tied to sacrifice. Ultimately, it's tied to what will you sacrifice for this tree, right? And that ties it back to religion. So, so somehow through the writing, I've kind of gotten a little closer to 
what the core problem is in terms of valuation in our religion, our common global religion. Um, and it's, that's why we're so unhappy. <laughs> I mean, it's because we have to think of everything in the wrong way all the time. That's an interesting statement. Is that, are, are we really unhappy? And if so, is that why we're unhappy? I don't know. I mean, it's an interesting thing to consider. I mean, it's worth thinking about. This is, that, that's my, let's just say that's my proposition. I would say that it makes us, it makes us profoundly unhappy to be thinking how many we like something rather than how much. Well, the one thing I do know is that at particular point, if you have like, in 1920, in 18, in 1900, yeah, if you want to build a railroad, you're going to need a lot of capital. You're going to need a lot of money. You're going to need a lot of people. You're going to need a lot of steel. And you're going to have to have these massive accumulations of capital and these massive coordinations of people to build a railroad. If that's what you want to do, if you want to build a railroad. And that's why, you know, during the early part of the Industrial Revolution, you had these massive command and control structures and these massive accumulations of capital because you're building really, really, really big things. But now with the implementation of AI and with computer technology, I mean, I'm just stating what other, a million other people have stated much more eloquently than I have, which is that you just don't need this heavy industry anymore. You don't need this heavy command and control structures because you have computers that allow you to do it much more lightweight. Mm -hmm. um, and allow people, like in your books, people, there's all these nodes and these routers and you have all these algorithms that are automatically sensing and weighing opinions and, and, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, um, getting at the subjective through percentiles rather than through points, yeah. Right, and the, and, and the thing is, is that a lot of, a lot of, I, I, perhaps the simplest way to state is that a lot of what you believe your ideological structure is, is based a lot upon what your available technology is. And certain technologies, like if, if the way to get your music to a whole bunch of people at the same time is radio, mm -hmm. well, you're going to, you're going to, that's going to determine a lot of things. Whereas if the way to get your songs to a lot of people is uh, on the internet, Mm -hmm. that's a different song and dance and and technology really forces you to change a lot of things and the thing i see is that a lot of things that people see as eternal truths about what the economic system is and the reason why we do things is because this this and this and ideological i'm like i think a lot of it has to do with what kind of technology you have lying around like do we have like a lot of iron lying around okay let's use that uh, oh, oh no! Now we got. Now we figured out how to take petroleum and distill it. Let's let's use that. I'm not a big fan of ideology. I'm a big fan of technology, and then people make up ideological reasons to justify. But I think a lot of it depends upon what kind of technology you have um, and what you can pull off. Uh, so I, I'm kind of I, I hate to say hopeful. But I think it's. I think we're certainly getting getting much more efficient about things. We're not. We're not. We're not digging up the earth and blowing up millions of stuff to make things. But the problem is there's now 8 billion of us. So even if for, per person we're doing a lot less damage to the environment, we've got a lot more people. But I think, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm guardedly optimistic that, mm -hmm. and we'll also start thinking, we'll, more people will start talking the way that we're right. talking here, which is that people will start rethinking things and saying, hey, what would it be like? And they, they won't be labeled commies. And they won't yeah. be labeled anarchists. And people just say, hey, could we do this another way? Like, you know, can we can we just talk about that without, like, being put in jail? You know, is there a way that we could possibly do this whole thing without this or without money or without this or without right. that or without agriculture? Is there a way we could do away with agriculture and just print food or right. whatever, you know, right. without, the without being – immediately arousing the ire of every agricultural related person. You know, you do world. eventually, you do eventually, but then if you've got a million, you know, YouTube streams a day, you know, it's kind of hard to put it down, but yeah. Yeah. Or, but just, so the good news is I think maybe we're getting past a point where you're just going to be labeled where, where, where you're going to be labeled a commie on this stuff. And you can actually start thinking about, you know, how would we do this? Cause one of the things I think about is, you know, like I said, food, you know, I think, feeding people by planting a seed in the ground and waiting for it to grow up and then cutting it and then grinding it up. It's like, whoa, dude. I mean, is there a better way we can do this? I mean, can hmm. we like, can we like, can we like print food? 
Right. Can we just make it? Because the whole idea of like growing a cow and then oh, killing yeah. it. Yeah. And then all that stuff. I mean, there's a moral issue to it. And there's also a huge resource issue to it and all that kind of stuff like that. Is there any way we can, <laughs> any way we can also, like, yeah, was, print this? Was, yeah. You know, and I think a lot of people say yes. And that's why they, these are the people who are making the impossible burger. And they're the people right. who are making this, but they're but, still relying upon stuff that's stuff that's growing out of the ground. I don't know that we can get away from growing things out of the ground. I'm not, I'm not sure. I guess I have to think about it. I mean, that would be interesting. You could. I mean, I think one of the key things, one of the things that will upend everything if they manage to pull it off is fusion energy. I yeah. don't know if they ever will, but if you do have an infinite supply of infinitely free, non-polluted energy, oh, all yeah. kinds of doors start to open. Oh, up. I know. And it's so funny because I, this is the thing that I, I always, I get stuck on. And I think, I, I don't know if I'm, I'm a broken record on this, but listen, we have it. We have, we have an amazing fusion reactor that runs 24 hours a day, yeah. seven days a week. And it's just, it's just uh, eight light minutes away. Yeah. And it's, it's dumping energy on our planet yeah. all the time. We just, what we don't, what we need is a battery, yeah. right? We need to just, we just need to like cover everything with collectors. And I'm talking about the sun, cover everything with collectors and then have Figure out some batteries. way, yeah, and how to, and that's, that's true. If it certainly we could collect enough energy right now, the problem is the storage and transmission technology. But again, yeah. if you get to that point where the cost, you know, look what happened when the cost of moving a bit from one side of the planet to another dropped by a factor of 10 million, which is what happened. Yeah. It changed the world. Oh yeah. And, and that, and the other thing, of course, if you had limitless free energy, you'd find that everybody wanted limitless free energy. Right? Well, that's the problem. Right? That everyone, like, yeah. The use and uh, expands to, to the capacity. Right. Um, but the key thing you could do at that point is you could seriously start thinking about things like, you know, atomic assembly, you know, really yes. radical ways yes. of putting things together because you got all because the energy in free. the world. The energy is free. Eric Chasen said, even with fusion, we end up with a heating problem no matter what. Um, you know, yeah. we will end up generating heat from all that energy and that heat That's so ultimately is going to get reflected back down if you've got a lot of, I mean, even without the greenhouse gases, you end up with, with an energy problem. He had done the math back in the 80s, you know, and he was like, we can postpone this, but we're going to have a heat problem. Yeah. So you have to be like Larry Nivens. You have to be like the puppeteers yeah. and yeah. you have to actually move the earth. The puppeteers. Yeah. I know. Yeah. The highest. Okay. 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 Let's call it.